And welcome to the Hello. first of a WordPress multi-site 201 series with joined today by Pilot Irwin and our kind of regular returning host, I imagine, will be Tom Woodward. Um, and we will be talking today about terms of use, DMC takedowns, and other things that go bump in the night. I can't make these titles up. I leave that to our professionals in the writing room and back. That's beautiful. So today we are going to talk about terms of use, DMC takedowns, and other things. And Tom, I think you're going to get us started. Am I right? You are. And I will, just for fun, um, share share a little, a little bit of slides, right? So, and I thought it'd be fun since uh, Jim and I have both started a WordPress multi-site um, and <laughs> been a little nervous about it, perhaps. Maybe, maybe Jim wasn't. I was a little nervous um, because you're starting this big thing with all these people and you're like, uh, it's a bit like throwing a party. Um, you, you're going to try and invite people. You're nervous. No one will come. Uh, if they do come, you want them to have fun. Uh, and you're also a little bit worried they might trash your house and the police might come. So <laughs> maybe maybe that's a really good analogy. Uh, the more I think about it, it just came to me right now. But this was the stuff I, I came to the party worried about. I was worried that like people would say rude things or give themselves names like, uh, I don't know, something inappropriate. Uh, I won't, I won't <laughs> give some examples. Just let your imagination run wild. Um, and then uh, one of the high pressures was like making sure a bunch of people like came to this thing and did stuff. Um, and that really was was a fair amount of pressure. Uh, and it drove kind of the next thing is wanting to have enough plugins and themes to like make this a good thing. And I kind of see these three elements as the main human-y things uh, that I was worried about um, kind of right off the bat. So with you, Jim, was it similar or? It was <laughs> It was similar. I think it was a little earlier than the VCU one. And oh, then yeah. we had done something similar, though, at Richmond, and we ran up against kind of different um, obstacles. But I remember speaking to the idea of, like, wrong or inappropriate names. Like, we were pretty gung-ho, and I think it was young enough of a project that we hadn't dreamt up all the problems, but we were getting a lot of pushback. Like, someone's going to say something inappropriate someone's going to post something inappropriate. And our provost at the time, who was new, and we had Mary Washington, one of the things that was happening at that time is there's so much higher, there was like higher management turnover for all sorts of weird reasons. So she comes in and she's like, so you want to do this thing, right? And you're like, yeah, but you know, there have been some concerns about whether people say, she's like, sooner or later, someone's going to say dildo. You just got to go ahead with it. <laughs> it's like, that is awesome. Like she basically like was like, that's the worst thing that could happen. It's not going to be the end of the world and run with it. And it was liberating because so many people were so concerned about all the things that could happen that it prevented them from actually doing it and realizing that the things you think could happen won't. It's the other things you never thought of that will really you know, start to get you. But I, I I had a very similar situation. And luckily, we had someone who, you know, had some clout, who was like, that's not the end of the world, things are going to happen. And she had a great way of communicating it that was very funny. And it kind of, like, everybody kind of relaxed a bit. And then we went forward. And in fact, no one ever did say that. <laughs> that so was going to be my next question. Yeah, <laughs> did, did it happen? <laughs> not that I know of. Because I think that was like part of it is we had seen, you know, because it was when we did this, Gardner Campbell was involved, who was also involved with y'all at Mary Washington. So we had seen that and had at least a little bit of an inkling of what the possibilities were, which is uh, easier than starting from scratch. But in the entire time we were doing this, I mean, I think like 
you know, out of thousands and thousands of users, we had like one person do, you know, like one oddly named site, which turned out to be kind of okay in the end. And um, we had like a, a little bit of comment problems from an external person but that's that's all we ever had in terms of drama as a matter of fact we had one instance where somebody did this kind of crazy post around corseting i don't know if you've ever seen that it was news to me but like when they do piercings and then thread them up with like ribbon i haven't seen that no. yeah it's super crazy that's um, new to me yeah, it was new to me, but this person posted, you know, their back was done like that. And I was super nervous like that. A lot of weird things were going to happen, but it was the probably the most supportive comments from all these people in her class that I could imagine. It, it still made me nervous, but it, it was just one of those examples where I was like, wow, that, that did not did not go. As, surprise. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's just just kind of strange in that way. Um, I think, I, I, I mean, I absolutely, my experience aligns completely with yours in that, in that how many years, 10 years, we were doing UMW blogs, <clears throat> excuse me, we had one site that was flagged as an issue. And the site was a legitimate student site that was writing a satirical essay about um, pedophilia. And oh. <laughs> obviously that can go wrong if the satire isn't right. very good, right? The rough one. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so we were like, yeah, this probably like, but it was almost more of a concern about like, who's your audience? What are you saying? Like, is this satire working? Like it was actually very much the work of higher ed and thinking through voice and what you're doing and how you're doing it. And they did take it down. It's not like we even had to come in and strong arm, but it was an interesting conversation that was like the one time where we were like, it was brought to our attention and we're like, we probably should reach out to the student and find out like <laughs> what's going on here. <laughs> right? So for your first foray into comedy, <laughs> <laughs> satire about pedophilia <laughs> should we rethink this um well and and i think that that's been the the beautiful and interesting thing is is having uh, people surprise you in positive ways with this like one of my favorite things was i did i did subscribe to the alerts every time a new user or site was created and for a while there, I would post the most interesting username uh, chosen, you know, that that week on on Twitter or something like that. And I, I got a kick out of it anyway. But it was it was kind of fun to see the creativity there and what people did. Um, and also the focus. I'm sorry. I, I, like yeah, I, said, yeah, I yeah. won't stop. But the focus yeah. and I think Gardner Campbell, who was a part of both, like a good example of, of I think, a positive frame is you could always focus on here's all the things that could go wrong and some of them do but never as much but I think he was for us a very good kind of anchor here are all the things this is going to provide students in terms of a voice and in terms of a space to learn and and I think highlighting that and focusing on that because I do think it was true and that it provided some very powerful experiences early on for these students and faculty with a platform that they would become familiar with WordPress. So I think like how you just decide to focus on it and how you can kind of try and contain some of the uh, FUD or fear, uncertainty and doubt around mm -hmm. what could happen with, well, here's what we're going for. And it's very manageable and doable within the context is probably a good antidote for some of that. Yeah. And I think coming up with a plan as well for, okay, in the absolute one, what is the absolute worst case scenario? How likely is that to happen? What's the likeliest thing that will happen? And in that worst case scenario, how would we deal with it? Is going to, I think, just help a lot of people go, oh, actually, that's way more reasonable than I thought it would be. 
Yeah, I think naming naming your fears <laughs> and preparing for them, and also just coming to terms with the idea that if if you're going to do this or try and do this in a way that covers all risk in all scenarios, you just won't do it. Um, so go ahead and stop and save yourself a lot of hassle. You know, there you can't be innovative, you can't push boundaries, and have no risk. You can lessen risk, you can have reasonable risk, but there, there's always going to be risk in these things and you need to come to terms with that. And hopefully you have somebody like the provost at Mary Washington or, you know, in my case, Gardner Campbell kind of backing up the, the choices that you're making and understanding what's going on. Yeah. Can I, can I ask you a question, Tom, on this slide? I mean, so, if we it kind of cover it, but I, I'm just interested. How did you ultimately get people on rampages? Well, the the scale stuff we dealt with uh, because we were able to kind of hook in with the the freshman writing experience focused inquiry courses, um, and so they were supposed to work on I think multimodal arguments and digital literacy and multimedia kind of uh, fluency. So this was the tool they were going to use to do all that. Um, and so we ended up having the opposite problem. I had too many people, <laughs> which um, is a bit like having too many people at a high school party at your house. All of a sudden things go very, very badly. And your house starts to get trashed. And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's what we ended up dealing with. So I think, you know, in terms of getting people having a, a firm hook into something that's happening institutionally already, but also maybe doing that not at the scale of several thousand people at once um, is, is, a, is a better path, you know, kind of work your way upwards. Um, but that, that got us people, too many people. Um, I don't know. At Mary Washington, it seemed like it was more organic. Was that the case? There was a, Yeah, it was a lot of, like, class visits. It was a lot of, like, working with faculty to say you should do this as part of their class. And, like, there was programs that came in post facto. But I think a lot of earlier on, there was, like, you know, this was a course driven thing. And this was kind of trying to get people excited about that. And like a lot of like early pavement pounding to get like people to even think about why would I do this? So, and it, we framed it as an alternative publishing space. So mm -hmm. students could do things they couldn't do in the LMS, like embed videos, make links that go to the web, be accessible to other people at other schools, et cetera. So yeah, it was a kind of still that early kind of wide eyed. Wow, this is open. This is the web and it's yours. Right. Yeah, there's I think there's some real advantage to that, because in our case, the scale went up so quickly. I think a lot of faculty ended up using it, but not really knowing why they were using it or ever mm -hmm. having that conversation. Uh, and I just don't know if you can scale, <laughs> you know, like it's one thing to have examples. It's one thing to have documentation. It's one thing to do a presentation to, you know, 50, 100 people. But it's it's very different to kind of be able to use it with them or get them started with it. And maybe even only doing that with people who are willing rather than almost by fiat having this yeah. thing thrust upon them. Totally. Uh, and technically, these were the two things I was mostly worried about, and, and maybe some people are being tense. Don't worry, I just add it nine twenty eight to the to the to the. You updates. put that in, but you edited that to be scary. <laughs> yes, yes. So, but that's kind of what I felt like at times. You know, all of a sudden I'd look one day and it'd be like fifty six updates, and I'd be like, oh dear there's no way I'm going to be able to test any of this. And I would often just click the button for update and be like, well, I'm, it'll probably be all right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I'm sure there's a backup someplace. Um, <laughs> Reclaim. <laughs> exactly. But in, in all the times I did it, 
I, I mean, the only the only plugin I ever had uh, lots of problems with, honestly, was Beaver Builder, and I think that was more with its relationship to multi-site rather than anything else. Um, okay. You know, not saying you shouldn't test things, um, and you know, but also realizing, like, depending on the complexity of your system. A lot of times you can't. And I was more concerned with not updating and having like a, uh, some sort of security issue than I was about the plugin breaking something or the theme update breaking something, um, you know, in some sort of interrelationship. So. Do you have an estimate of how many plugins or themes you guys thought would be like useful at the beginning and whether that number scaled at all? Well, I'd, I'd say we really made some horrible mistakes there in that we would often in our desperation to get more people on there would pretty much just be like, okay. By request. Yeah. And we would just throw things in there and a number of people could throw things in there who maybe shouldn't have been able to. You know, so mm -hmm. we didn't really have a formal approval process to get plugins in there. Um, we certainly said yes to people when they were like, but I don't like Twitterific. I like Twitterific E. And we'd be like, okay, what? Well, is it going to uh -huh. get you? On, can we get you in a car today if we're willing to do this? And so at, at certain points, like that's the way it was, we would do basically anything to get you in a car today. Um, and as a result, we ended up with like way more than we should have, uh, you know, like I said, really duplicative things, um, you know, uh, and they ended up almost with, I was worried, you know, back here, did we have enough cool things to get people to come in? And then we, what we ended up with was we had so many things, people got a little bit of choice fatigue and kind of like, there's too was, much stuff. Yeah. I was, I was going to say that the thing you mentioned earlier about particularly faculty who are using it without knowing sort of why, how to make best use of it, particularly, I think I've had experiences with faculty going, yeah, I don't really know why this plugin is, is it useful? Should I be using it? Yeah. How should I be using it? Like, what does it do for me? And the answer is, I don't know what you want. I can't right. say that. Well, but and, having lots of plugins feels like it would cause that conversation to scale. I don't know. Right. Yeah, and you would come into certain sites and you'd be like, oh, dear Lord, you have 67 plugins activated. <laughs> why? why is it slow? <laughs> Are you yeah. using them all? Uh, and you would ask that and they'd just be like, well, I just wanted to see what they would do, but they never turned them off. Um, <laughs> that, you know, they just turn them on and be like, is anything different? And a lot of times they couldn't tell. Cause like, who knows what the hell that thing's supposed to do. Um, and I you just it have to, for a yeah. reason. right, right. And I just, you know, no harm, that's, no foul. That's when I started to figure out a little bit of like must use plugins and the plugins that like we wanted, like say for syndication and certain things that we wanted to happen. But you're right. That choice fatigue became a real issue where the what we thought was this great supermarket of options just became a list that no one really looked at. Right. And the potential harm it was doing, although, like you said, we we just updated. We took the faith and the seed that everything was going to work. And a lot of times to WordPress's credit, it did. But like, yeah, I think. If I were going to be doing it now, I would be super intentional about the plugins and the themes. And I would, you know, build them and add only if I really felt it added something like, but you, like, I would throw anything in there. It wouldn't matter. Oh, yeah, this gallery, that gallery, this, you know, edit PHP on the front end for anyone. Like, yeah, sure. PHP, again, why not? Yeah. I think also it may be useful 
I don't imagine that most users had an idea of it, but the difference between a network active plugin, which is the admin saying, no, this is essential. This is something that you need versus, yeah, it's available. It's off by default. You don't need it, but if it's here if you want it, would be useful for people to just sort of, again, that's maybe a conversation that's just not feasible at scale, but for people to sort of understand what the platform offers inherently versus, you know, what's an option if you want it, if it's, it's useful. It's a good point, Pilot. And a lot of those early conversations with the faculty or the students, like when we were going to classes, would center around this is what you're expected to do for this class. Here's the plugins and themes that right. are recommended. So like there would be some direction, whereas if someone was just getting it to get a site, they may not have that same, you know, orientation early on to what they're using and why. So in some ways it was legitimate why some of those plugins started to add up because different classes had different ways in which they wanted to use the platform. So it wasn't just completely willy nilly, but it's quickly, once it gets a little bit of momentum, how quickly that stuff starts to add up because everyone has a different idea of how you want to build the site. And that was the whole advantage of it is like, you could do it. So why would we say no? Right. And it's, it's trying to walk that line between providing the avenues so that they don't just abandon the thing. Cause like, what's the point? And creating like something that doesn't just feel like it's spinning out of control and it's a difficult line to walk at times but i think doable mm -hmm. um i just didn't do it <laughs> um and i think the other thing i was concerned about was uh was storage which didn't end up being quite the problem that i thought it was going to be Although I would say these days it probably is, uh, you know, just because images and things like that have become so much larger. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so when people take pictures with their phones now or something like that and use that in a site, like those things are giant. Yeah. Um, so I, I think this would be more of a concern these days. But in the at, the, at that time, you know, it's kind of interesting on most student portfolio sites, uh, a lot of times and this may be a failure of, of the system itself, our whole attempt was like, a lot of times it might be the default theme, no plugins have been activated and very little media has been used, uh, at least that was uploaded to the media library. So, you know, it's an interesting thing to look at. It's like, what do you set the storage defaults to and when do you set exceptions to them? Um, becomes kind of an interesting conversation. You know, these days, I think I would go ahead and like, I'd prevent video uploads <laughs> and I would probably default um, turn on for the network, something like insanity mm -hmm. to limit the picture sizes on upload to something reasonable, you know, like 1200 pixels or something like that. Yeah, I know that we, I think without that for a lot of users, they're like, yeah, why not? Biggest size. It'll look nicest. Um yeah. When we had that for students who did photography and art, we're like, yeah, this is the size that I want everyone to see it at. So I'll upload it that way. Not really realizing that there's very diminishing returns and it's going to just eat up so much storage space. It's not going to be worth it. And also well, they can't really see those numbers on a WordPress multi-site. They don't have a sense of how much space they're using. Right. And Unsplash and a number of those kind of free stock image sites now, like they give you that file at a giant size. That's what I've seen lately um, on our domain of one's own instance is like people tossing those things up. <laughs> it's trying to load like a eight or 10 megabyte image file for, for no reason, you know, to be seen at 400 pixels. Mm -hmm. WordPress also does a particular thing where if you upload an image, it goes neat. Um, well, I'm gonna need this as a thumbnail here and also here and also here. So I'm just gonna save this six times in a couple of different sizes, just yeah. in case, which is, I guess, Which is effective. confounding <laughs> because you have so many copies of your image, you don't know which one to use. I hate that. <laughs> 
I assume. Yeah. But insanity is kind of, that's the whole idea of trying to make this, like if I was doing a WordPress multi-site, it would be about making it more efficient and effective and streamlined and mm -hmm. like giving, getting a sense of how people are using it and trying to make sure like it's elegant and there's a couple of plugins and a couple of nice themes and they can trust that when they go, you know, it will be fast and it will be effective. And I, I would go away from the bloat that I had kind of promoted for decades. <laughs> Going for minimalism this time around. Exactly. As my hairline goes increasingly back, <laughs> I, I can feel the minimalism. Take well, over. live and learn, right? Um, right. Yeah, I think there's there's something to be said for that. And I think like the, the environment as... <laughs> All right, so that was the stuff I was worried about. And let's let's take a look at maybe what I should have been worried about. And this is going to sound a bit elitist, but rather than getting like as many people as possible, probably getting the right people, um, you know, and, and thinking about it a little more organically rather than trying to, what's it, like eat the cow in one bite or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, like we we could have approached this along the same route, but maybe gotten up to speed a little more carefully and thus been able to show better examples and have better people in the discipline to spread the message uh, and thus scale that better. Um, you know, when you're, you know, talking to fellow colleagues, sometimes like they're able to have communication and conversations in ways that, that external people can't. Mm -hmm. I think I imagine it's also um, to some degree, rather than just getting as many people to log in and make a site, getting people who really will make effective use of what's going on, um, who understand what's being offered and how they can use it well, which I don't right. know. There, there's maybe also something to be said for sign up and learn on on the fly but it's that i i know that uh at carlton's wordpress multi-site uh there was a lot of when we did cleanup a lot of blogs that were very clearly someone had logged in and had a site auto generated for them and then they just didn't have any use for it I, I do have to say one of the things that I think because it was early on and there wasn't the kind of expectation of WordPress, it was still new. Mm -hmm. A lot of those faculty who went into it and like became believers in some ways, like it did create a pretty good culture of like faculty who were into it. You know, there was always some okay. who weren't, but like for us early on at Mary Washington, I can only speak from that experience. It did, it did felt like the right for, early on and for most of that, the right people were in there. They were kind of leading their students. They had a clear idea of how they wanted to use it. It wasn't a mandate, which mm -hmm. is a big difference. Because at the point it's a mandate, there are people who go in there, like even faculty and staff and who will resent it and it will show. So like in that regard, it was lucky. Although, you know, at a certain point, you know, people move on. And so like the detritus sets in. But I do think that is a good point. And I wonder, depending upon how you're framing out, you're, is it a mandate? Um, if it's a mandate, it better be very streamlined and simple and not a lot of choices. And like it be f highly effective in getting people to where they need to be simply without being mm -hmm. pissed off. So they come back to you and hate the mandate yeah, versus, I think, you know, a playground. I, yeah, I think also what I was talking about was maybe more along the lines of students, less so than faculty, because... I, again, this is pretty anecdotal, but I remember looking through this and going, okay, the most actively used stuff, the people who very clearly got the most into it were faculty members who wanted to build out project sites, uh, like personal resume, professional sites, um, people who wanted to use it for course blogging with their students. And then a lot of the blank sites looked like students who had logged in because they were asked to do it as part of a class project. And then they did the class project and went, 
no, I'm not going to use this anymore. Like they never really got into it. And so. I hunted those people down and <laughs> yeah. they lived up to their contract. Okay. Well, it's, it's tricky. Cause I mean, if you get, you know, 50 fact or let's, let's say 20 faculty who aren't really bought into it, but they feel like they have to use it and they have 30 students each. Now you've got like 600 people on the site who are, maybe not getting the best directions, you mm -hmm. know, like there's, there's a lot of load that can come with that, that can eat up your time, which kind of gets into this idea of like, if you're doing stuff that's really non-standard in this space, then the kind of work it requires in terms of support and being able to work with those people who tend to be awesome, but also tend to be using WordPress in ways that are non-standard and thus require conversation and custom work and conversation and more custom work like realizing how that work plays out is is really i think important because you're dealing with not just your workload as an individual but faculty workloads it's it's a balancing act yeah and sometimes i think maybe running into faculty members who have gotten really into it and learned a whole lot. And they come to you with a question that's like, so here's something that I don't understand. And you go, uh Oh, if you don't understand it, <laughs> yeah. let me get back to you on that one. <laughs> let me go do some Googling. <laughs> and so, yeah, like I, I almost expand the idea a bit here with like, you're not going to have everybody in that crazy innovation, amazing work zone. So it's like, what's, what's the balance? What's the balance you can support? What's the balance you have at your institution? You know, like trying to figure out there in terms of users, you know, what level of, of crazy stuff can you support? Like I, I still look back regretfully on a couple things we didn't get to, to kind of complete a VCU with like some really wild art professor or, you know, if only I'd have had more time or energy in this particular project, but I was spending lots of time and energy on dealing with scale. And so I had less time to spend on what I feel like was more transformative work. So trying to figure out that balance, I think is, is tricky. I think one of the, the kind of, how would you say kind of like the the holy grail something that's always elusive that i saw early on and i never saw it completely materialize but i still think to your point with the right balance of people and with the right kind of contingent or cohort joining you could have all these distributed people writing really cool stuff and then you could find a way through wordpress multi-site in one thing to aggregate it so it does highlight all of the cool stuff happening across these classes. Like I still believe in my heart of hearts that that was the real sell for higher ed and for a community like this, for an institution like, you know, a university or a college or what have you to sh highlight the cool thinking and work and doing that in a way that was both thoughtful. And, and I, I think we got close, but we never realized that because I think that would have, allowed that flow of new people to come in once they saw what was happening to come in and want to kind of do that as well and then it builds its own culture and then you're not having to police that you're just saying here's the site do great stuff right absolutely that virtuous cycle of like use reuse communication interrelationship like having it be like this amazing thing that that you can then see the the value and worth of all this work, like, you know, I mean, like, that is it, that is it. And like, I feel like people have gotten close a couple times, but like, it certainly has a lot more room before you hit the ceiling um, than anything I've ever seen done. You know, it could just be so incredible. I always want it like, you know, the photography classes, images being fodder in this other classes consideration 
for, I don't know, collages or in designing sets in the theater department. You know what I mean? Like just having all this stuff kind of meet together and really get it. This true interdisciplinary kind of community of people leveraging the work that these students are doing that usually just goes into a drawer or is graded and then disappears like that. That is, that is what I dreamed of. It is a real argument too. I would say for this idea of balance of people and balance of courses. And I think the mistake I made early on was always being wondered about numbers and then numbers driving how I could report it, you know, whether it's just out of ego or out of, sustainability or out of whatever but it's like maybe it just took four or five classes that were doing exactly that kind of crossover with you know 20 students each that would have been just as powerful and just as kind of compelling a narrative as i have five thousand people on the site now right, right. like like it, it's it there's something there and i think we respond to that data because it was new and it was amazing to think you could even do that but, you know, again, maybe in retrospect, finding that way to just do one really cool crossover of different posts to show the community at large would have been enough. Mm-hmm. Well, it's easier to say, right? I can say a thousand people and people are like, oh, that's impressive. But if I try to describe it, I end up sounding like a lunatic. And they're like, yeah, <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> education really exciting good job there buddy and they're like we're gonna take our money elsewhere so it's it's trying to figure out like what's a what's a sellable product to whoever you're trying to sell it to so much like you know it, it's, it's it's tough um but you know it's, it's possible there's cool stuff we can do the stuff I should have been worried about, what ended up being a little bit of a hassle, or at least is becoming more of a hassle, is probably these three things: um, privacy with GDPR, as well as where you know I, I was in the state of Virginia. Um, they had a bunch of weird changes around like what could be seen by whom regarding just student emails uh, in strange ways, caused us a lot of complexity and worry. Uh, Copyright stuff, which we'll address more more explicitly with the DMCA things as soon as we get moving, um, became a bigger deal. You got Pixie and other sites like that that are doing these automated searches. And now like VCU has been hit a couple times with takedown notices and I think really sketchy kind of threatened lawsuits for stuff that's like nine, 10 years old. And then general just the complexity overall can get can get really big because that in rampages we didn't have a well we had an explicit methodology of saying we're not going to take any of these sites down unless somebody requests it that was our that was our desired thing but when leadership changed um that became a problem and now reclaim and uh poor matt roberts at vcu now are trying to figure out like what do we do now at this degree of scale to deal with all this complexity and all these old accounts and you know thousands of sites um what do we do All right. We were talking complexity. complexity. Yeah. Yeah. As, as I was saying, poor Matt Roberts is stuck there with a change of leadership. He's got, you know, 36,000 sites or something ridiculous like that. And now he has to try and figure out like what, what to do now that things have changed substantially in terms of what they're supposed to save and keep. And, you know, I went by Rampages today just to see what the registration process looked like. And they're only doing registrations for faculty sites right now. So no student sites whatsoever. So, you know, this is, this is difficult stuff to navigate in the short term, but it's really hard to figure out how to keep these sites running when you're talking about the long term, when you're talking about 10 years or 15 or 20 years. I mean, that's, that's crazy timelines with technology and institutions. So um, in general, Jim, if you could have saved Shannon from 
certain problems at UMW, what, what, what would you have, what would you have done differently? Yeah. I, I think you learn it even while you're an admin is, you know, themes and plugins don't have the life you thought they would when you first installed them or were fairly new to WordPress. Like they, they expire quickly, right? It's like the milk in your fridge. <laughs> They're not going to last that long. And so I, I think, you know, calling some of that and being a little bit more forward thinking, but you only knew what you knew when you were doing it. And I think that was fair. Mm -hmm. There's a fair balance, but to your earlier point, I was going to make this is it's amazing. Despite the complexity of these systems, like tens of thousands of sites, right? Tens of thousands of users. And you're still like having sites that run pretty effectively, pretty efficiently, and could be managed by one or two people. Um, that's the case with you and very blogs. It's still the case with Rampages and case with many other work. But like, I think in that regard, despite the complexity, these systems are pretty resilient at staying up. And I, I like that balance because they are the things you worry about as an admin. No two ways about it. Like these are the things that keep you up at night. But at the same time, I probably would be more concerned about privacy and copyright than like themes and plugins, given the ecosystem around WordPress. Mm -hmm. I guess the other question with complexity comes themes and plugins too out of date. Do you get hacked? And that's a kind of like where it comes over with with security. But um, yeah, I, I found for Shannon, I don't know. I mean, I think Shannon's doing the smart thing right now. So UMW Blogs is coming on its 15th year. And they are basically sunsetting that. They opened up a new one and they're going to archive it all as static media. And that's going to live as a kind of timeline. You on their blogs, the same URL as an archive and all new sites and they're starting fresh. Mm -hmm. And I think there is something probably really relieving about that for them. Like they don't have to have the technical debt that I had kind of pushed on them Um uh, 10 years earlier and yeah. so I like I would, that solution yeah and you don't have to um <laughs> saying deal with users sounds so cynical but the idea of if you say okay you don't need too many themes and plugins you want to make sure that you're picking ones that you think will be supported for a long time you want to make sure that you're going back and checking things you want to be managing things you want to make sure that workload is simple uh, and you try and do that on a older site, people will get mad at you if you take things away from them. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, once um, uh, it's like teachers, they used to claim like, like if, uh, you know, don't smile until Christmas. Not that I think that's a good example, but like, yeah, you can't go easy and then try and be hard. You know, you have to kind of. Yeah. And so the ability to to say for Shannon Oh, well, your site looks the same, but if you, we're starting fresh and fresh means newer rules, simpler yeah. stuff. It's certainly a new way to deal with that. You know, and, and I think you, I think a point to Tom's idea of the complexity, the complexity gets to a point where you can continue to take away stuff and piss people off, or you can basically say, that was what it was at the time it was, you know, we can now move beyond that and basically have a uh, effectively a um, new space and keep an archive. And I think that's what was smart about what Shannon did. Shannon did um, think of it archivally so that um, that site still lives. The work they did is still there and preserved by UMW, but now they can start fresh and integrate it more directly with their other programs. So, it makes a lot of sense. It was the most elegant way to do it because no matter how you did it, it was going to be hard. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, yeah, I don't know. There's some fun stuff to think about that. Like, like what would you do? You know, could you spin up individual WordPress multi-sites with the idea that it's going to last four years or five, you know, like <laughs> and encapsulate it that way? I don't know. There's some crazy stuff that might happen if you, if you started thinking about those uh, sort of batch things it might be fun. The thing about DMCA takedowns, I mean, and that was the thing. And I remember 
We didn't get really any. I think we got like one or two. But YouTube saved us a ton because they were doing a lot of that work because a lot of the ones that they would come after would be video and it was happening on YouTube. And so those videos would go away. Very rarely did someone look for an article or something like that. Um, maybe we got one or two where someone was sharing a PDF. But like literally it was never overhead for us. And it was never for the time we did it. And I believe that's still the case for Shannon, but I'm not sure. You know, it was really the questions of privacy. Students coming back after the fact and being like, I don't want that stuff up anymore. And like giving them ways to kind of shut down that stuff elegantly post facto, because a lot of it is linked to their UMW email or whatever school email. And sometimes that goes away. So that's a workflow I would definitely want to kind of factor in uh, right away is that students may want that stuff to go away and you should encourage them to do that while they're still a student. But should they come to you post facto, give them a space where they could fill out a form and you can make it you know, easy enough to say what their email was, maybe link it and then that site gets archived and comes offline or right? give them that ability because that does link back to stuff like GDPR and privacy. And I kind of think that's a good thing. People should have the right to take that stuff back off should they want to. If it's mm -hmm. a community site, though, or a group blog, it gets a little more complicated. I was going to say, talking to, uh, this was a conversation that I wish I'd had with more faculty at Carleton. There were professors who were like, yeah, this is a project that was done for my class. So the site is technically in my name or... Uh, like the students were the ones building the site, but I created it and then gave it a, like gave them like permit editing permissions or uh, this is a course blog. So it's in my name and it has some student work on it and the ability to say, okay, so I get that you want an archive of the work that's done in your course. I get that the department wants to be able to point to past student work and say, here's what you can do if you study with us. Where does that intersect with the right to be forgotten? If a student comes back and says, no, I don't want that up. The ability to say, look at capstone projects from years past. How are you going to respect those wishes? What What is your... I mean, it's always complicated when it's more than one author or something yeah. like that. But if it's a capstone, that's the students. And, you know, you give them a space to say, should you want us to not promote that? Here's the form that would go to the admin so that they would know. I think yeah. that kind of solves it. I think a lot of students don't mind having their stuff promoted or faculty or staff. But yeah. I think giving people the the kind of channels to change their mind. And yeah, no, I, I, that. sorry, I maybe should have clarified I agree with you that the students are correct. They should be able to say, no, I want this gone and then have it taken down. It was more a question of having that conversation with the faculty who would go, but why though? Ah, why? Gotcha. But but the, I need it to be up for one reason or another. Say, well, it's not really yours, yours. is the thing. Yeah, that's, they were, we've had that conversation and started to put it into some of the like project things. Like if you knew like this was going to be a multi-author thing with student authors, we would be like, all right, because this is their intellectual property, let's go ahead and make it clear to them what they're doing when they contribute here and that they're agreeing to use it in a particular way. Um, you know, and if, if you, they're they're kind of not quite signing a contract but they're committing you know and then down the line it's a little bit different if you want to get it removed if you've already kind of acknowledged your participation in a particular way um so that's that's one thing we played around with there uh with with those sorts of cycles but it's not a clean thing it's kind of messy um you know proving that you're um a person if you don't have the email address that start at the site is also yeah. kind of ugly, mm -hmm. you know, but it, the amount of people who would fake that they were somebody else know the email, you know, like you get into like probability of, of, of stuff, I think in those sorts of processes, but 
I think in the entire time we ran it, I maybe had five or 10 people ask for their sites to be deleted. What I would have done too is make a better, could I get the graduating people's email addresses, match it to the accounts and then at least prompt them. Like if you want to get rid of this thing, now's the time. I would have liked to have done a, a, a cycle like that with some better communication, but mm -hmm. we, we, we didn't have that kind of, uh, we never did it. Uh, I do want to hit the DMCA stuff a little bit because the copyright things I think have expanded. Like I said, Pixie, there are a number of other sites that are sending out these crawlers, you know, through sites just looking for things. So what you do as a, as a, like say I was a photographer, um, you put your work in there and then it spiders the web looking for matches. And if it finds one, it allow it shows it to you and you can be like send them a notification you know essentially like sue them sue them sue them and i think they'll like pay you a certain percentage of whatever whatever they get right and so this is happening at vcu right now not a huge amount but they've been hit by a couple of different notices um and so you you have a relationship here with your legal department probably your it department Everybody is probably already has a DMCA uh, takedown agent. It's the person for the university that's contacted when a copyright infringement thing is seen. And what that is, and I'm not a lawyer, blah, 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 clearly. Look, look at the sign. Look at me. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> but like the deal is with DMCA is you have like this safe harbor provision. And one of those is if you're running a network of things with users on it and they violate copyright, you're not responsible for that violation as long as you do the following things. And one of those things is you have somebody to talk to about the takedown, you respond in a reasonable way, blah, 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 blah. You know, so when we talk about not reinventing the wheel, um, that's a big one. So can you use the institutional DMCA process in person to deal with this stuff? Um, also having like at least a conversation maybe with legal counsel, um, assuming you have that kind of access. So you see what their position is. Are they like super worried about these kind of things and will like freak out? In which case, maybe that means certain things for you. Or if they're just like, yeah, we just tell them we took it down and roll on with life. And if they want to try and sue us, best of luck, buddy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's different positions people can take on this, depending on the lawyer you have, depending on your institution. Um, and you also want to play around with, like, if you're a public institution or a private institution, there are a couple things here that get involved, right? So public institutions, you have to worry about constraining free speech. Private institution, you don't have those concerns. But a public institution, there's some stuff that gets more uh, entwined and a little more complicated. So that's a thing to consider. And then... Also, you have to worry about, like, are you supporting fair use and yeah. in what way? We had a great example here where somebody was writing a paper about sexist advertising, and they used a number of sexist ads, and they were talking about them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, textbook fair use for academic and editorial purposes, and we got a takedown notice, and I was able to pop it up the chain, went to the provost. She was just like, <laughs> we're, we're backing this to the core. Don't worry about a thing. Leave it up there. Just tell them this is fair use and this is why. And we are happy to, to take this to the mat. So, I mean, mm -hmm. that was like a beautiful thing. Absolutely. But, but find that out first because you don't want to step into it, then have the upper people like, cut you off at the knees and you end up looking stupid and perhaps yeah. exposing yourself to, to additional drama. But that's, that's an important one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. I was wondering if you would ever, we never did have a fair use, you know, come to the, come to the fore, but that's interesting that you did and that you got support at the university level. That's, that must've been amazing. Yeah. It was, it really made me happy. I was like, this was, you know, an example of, academy kind of like working and doing what was supposed to and not 
cow-cowing to these people. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I think what you want, too, is you want your pattern for when you get a DMCA takedown notice. What do you do? Um, mm -hmm. You know, what we did is I essentially would go evaluate it first and be like, all right, is it fair use based on my rough understanding? Or is it like clearly a violation? Usually it was pretty clear. It was either fair use or it was like, yeah, that you shouldn't have done that. Um, so, it, you know, we didn't have a lot of middle of the road where it was debatable. Um, but if it was a problem, what do you do? Uh, what we did is we would contact the individual. We would say, hey, this is what happened. You know, what I've done so far is say this, like I might remove the link from the thing if it's really egregious, or I might say, I need you to respond to me by X if it's say a faculty member about whether you're going to contest this being fair use or not. And if so, da, 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 da. Like, so I had like a patterned email that I could copy and paste that would allow me to fill in the things. And if I didn't hear from them, I removed the content myself. If I felt super paranoid, I'd keep you a copy of it someplace. So if they lost their mind, I could send it back to them. But like we had a setup like that and I would notify our DMCA agent because we ran kind of a parallel program at that time that what I did, how fast I responded, all that sort of stuff. So establishing those patterns are important and good and you should do it. And if you template it out, it makes it so much easier for you to do it if it's repeatedly done. Um, and it just keeps everyone on the same page with regard to policy and procedure. And then you can have someone other than you do it because uh, these are not fun. It's just, you know, usually dumb work. So if you can get somebody else to do that, you know, I recommend it. Can uh, I ask you? That's, that's awesome, actually. I, that's a, we haven't had to deal with that. I guess it, as time went on, it became more and more common, like you're saying, with the Corollas and stuff and sophisticated ways to identify. Right. With the terms of use, I know that's something we mentioned early on in the title. Like, how did that, how did you set up your terms of use? I know for, for us at UMW, we basically said, here's our network use policy. This applies to UMW blogs as well. Click this button to agree and then sign up. Yeah. Right. We did something similar for, we, we actually, we recommend something similar for institutions that ask us, your IT department probably has a policy of, if the university provides this to you, here's what you're not allowed to do. And that's the end of, the story and th those can either be adapted or just pulled over usually. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, and that's what we've seen. I think people do. It's what we've done. Like, you know, what, what I say is don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, you know, you've got tons of policy written at your university already, like you just do. So which ones apply now it's interesting in terms of terms, like what might apply. Like when I looked at, UMW, it was interesting to see they use network and computer use policy, the honor code and the aspire statement of community values. Uh -huh. So you got a trifecta of things being used right now. Um, Georgetown rec references their main uh, acceptable use policy for IT and it re references reclaims use policy, which I thought was interesting. Um, so reclaim is getting powers maybe <laughs> delegated to it that it, you may not know about. Um, Thank you for letting us know. <laughs> but, you know, I think that's the way to do it. I think SUNY Oneata does some stuff, but it also adds uh, some context with just some statements. I think that that may be a thing to consider. It's like can you get some easily readable statements maybe mm -hmm. that don't become this thing, but you reference those things. So it's like, you know, I think Oneata does something like that with like, uh, what was it? It was, I'll throw the link in there. Um, you know, improve the society in which you live, be respectful, assume good intentions, report inflammatory stuff. Don't get involved. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think maybe little things like that are good um, in addition to linking to the more 
legalese and more specific things. Um, where you put them is also kind of interesting. So some people just have these, like by using this thing, you're agreeing to this stuff. Some people put it as part of the sign-in process, like Jim was describing. You know, you have to check yes, and then it allows you to move into the registration process. There are also some plugins or registration customization options you have that require that check off as part of the functional registration. And then you have like a record of it someplace. You know, how much you're worried about those different ways, you know, really, really depends. Um, and we can drop this link in the blog post for the week and probably in Discord as well. Yeah, and this is, um, you know, stuff that was volunteered in discourse. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we got these from different people. Um, I think we may end up having a place where you can submit these because it'd be kind of nice to have like institution, URL to the policy, maybe private or public, and whether it covers uh, a couple of these cover both, um, mm -hmm. say, a WordPress multi-site, and some of them also cover domain of one's own uh, installations. So because different universities have different setups like that, you know, it's kind of interesting to see how they've dealt with policy in different ways. It's yeah. interesting, too, because I do I do see this one from Oneonta. I hadn't seen it before until you mentioned it, which is why I brought it up. And the whole report, don't feed inflammatory posts, and these kind of points, it is a nice addition to terms of use to, like, put it in very, like, talking to someone as if, hey, here's some recommendations before you jump in rather than here's the long policy you'll never read, but this is what I right. expect. I do like that a lot. That's that's quite nice. Yeah. 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 I think, I, I mean, this is more, again, something for the chat, but I would be curious to hear similarly to um, – Tom, you're talking about the fair use and the DMCA takedowns and Jim, uh, the, just the idea of has anyone ever posted something you know, truly inappropriate? And like, I would be interested to hear people's experiences in the chat as well and how they dealt with it. Yeah, um, agreed. Like what, what they're, again, sort of what we've been talking about today, what their big concerns were going in and then what and, uh, sort of just popped up along the way. And we want all the lurid details too, by the way. <laughs> what happened to students' right to privacy, Jim? <laughs> exactly. Well, and this gets into two, like it starts to blend like technical things and community things and like what, what you have to do because one of the things that's technical that makes all this easier is having the privacy statement and the DMCA stuff in the footers of all the, uh, all the themes. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to like manually edit those. Um, right. Right. <laughs> so with, with WordPress multi-site, you can network activate a plugin and you can use the underscore footer to append things to the footers of all sites. Okay. And that's what we did with our privacy statement. It's what we should do with our DMCA statement for RAM pages. But that, that is another advantage to the WordPress multi-site is it lets you act across the sites in that way. Um, and That's great, actually. Yeah. I had no idea about that. Yeah, so I will throw another thing this is you know it's getting a little technical but this is level two and we've gone a lot of human policy stuff but it's just what is it it's like eight lines of code to to staple a thing yeah on yeah so what that page is um let me see if i can share it with you easily i'm working on that right now tom Oh, okay. There we go. All right. So it's it's nothing fancy. It's just that highlighted part. Uh, lines 113 to 123. And two of those lines are saying what in the hell it is. Um, <laughs> but you can see what I did is, one, 
I set a way to avoid writing the privacy thing. So that's what those uh, IDs are, is like, don't put the privacy thing on these. I think that was because they went with custom URLs or custom domains and they mm -hmm. thought they didn't want it. So I go, all mm -hmm. right. Uh, <laughs> but otherwise it would stamp this stuff out at the bottom in the footer. That's all. Mm -hmm. and, this, and so this is, yeah. I was just gonna say, is this whole document uh, including the privacy footer, but also the bit below remove emails for non super admins and stuff. This is all one plugin or these are just PHP snippets that you've pulled into different. Uh, they are the way we treated them was one plugin that was network activated that did all the stuff that we wanted. That was like strange. So we didn't mm -hmm. end up with like 50 plugins. Um, but this was all stuff we developed as we went through this that would do things like this. And so you could run just that one little snippet as a plugin. You can make it into its own plugin. Um, but we found it efficacious to just have a plugin that's kind of our custom Rampages stuff. And this is just one piece of it. So it's a bunch of other stuff too. That's great. I love this. It's, yeah, I highly recommend it. You will write your own stuff eventually if you have anything of any sophistication and you have the ability. Uh, if you don't have the ability, you know, I didn't either when I started, but, you know, however many years later, uh, you you can develop it, I, I assure you. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it, it's that's that's where you start to cross the line between technically what can I do to support this stuff? There are other things like that I'd really encourage you. So DMCA is a big thing. Accessibility uh, became a big thing for us, too. Um, you know, uh, VCU got an Office of Civil Rights investigation uh, uh, about website accessibility. And so Rampages ended up being brought into that as part of like this big, big deal that people were, you know, rightfully losing their minds about. So it got down into like, how are we helping make sure that Rampages is accessible? Um, and this is a policy and technical thing. So one, we had a site telling you uh, functionally, how do you write better accessible posts in WordPress. Using headings, alt text for your pictures, things like that. Right. Yeah. And we, we did, you know, just a little site on it that was somewhat useful, you know, and that kind of talked people through it and gave them a quick guide within WordPress, you know, about how do you choose a theme and see if it's accessible. Um, that was another mm -hmm. thing we started to do and that I wish I would have done from the beginning is that make sure any themes we brought from the WordPress repository met the accessibility checklist. And that yeah. is an actual evaluation that is done by a team of people that doesn't say that this is going to meet every aspect of WCAG 2.0, but it's a hell of a lot better than not being evaluated. So yeah. um, that's, that's kind of the, the path and pattern there. We also included like a couple of accessibility plugins um, that would, you know, that people could activate to, to, to kind of just show good faith effort to, mm -hmm. to try and make this better. Um, but and this is, yeah. I see the GDPR plugin too, or is that a homegrown one, this one idea of the got it? I think, I think it was, yeah, I think we started that early enough that it wasn't like a thing yet. So I think this is a slap together mishmash of some stuff. Um, and yeah, that's another thing. Like as this stuff evolves, like how do you deal with it? Like, is this, what's hard is like, if you don't have a good relationship with IT is making sure like you're doing the stuff in a way that's acceptable to the institution. And so that can be, mm -hmm. that can be tricky. Um, but at the very least, I think showing good faith um, and doing stuff like this is a lot better than doing nothing and being just like, well, we didn't know or something like that. Sure. So, I really like this accessibility web page. I'll be honest with you. Uh, it's quite, I mean, you all built so many beautiful resources like um, as part of that. And that's the other thing, the ability to push out these resources as you're doing this work, like, Obviously, a lot of it's under the gun and we're being investigated for civil rights abuses. <laughs> but like at the same time, that's a really, 
you know, compelling. And it's a site we've linked to again and again when talking about web accessibility. Yeah, um, it is well done as a resource. Well, it's a good thing to keep in mind. I know uh, Dan Silverman worked on that, who was like, a, he was a lawyer who happened to be working in our office, but not as a lawyer at all, which was kind of weird. So that was, <laughs> you know, like, it's always good to have those people around. Um, and it's it's part of this deal, right? Like copyright and DMCA stuff, and then the technical stuff to support it, accessibility and the yeah. stuff to support it. And it, it is, it entwines in lots of different ways and you got to kind of keep building these resources. You got to keep on top of the technology that's going to let you do it better. Um, but it's part of, part and parcel to, to thinking this through. Um, and then just what level of oversight you have overall is important as well. Like, are you checking the, all the sites? Are you running like automated scans? Like what is that going to cost you in terms of time and energy? Is it even possible? If not, like how, how do you know anything? Um, or, you know, what sort of position are you, are you putting, are you making it clear to people who need to understand that you're taking? Um, which is, you know, again, like relationships with the right people in the institution who talk about and deal with this stuff just so everyone's informed and like we didn't have great relationships with it um and that hurt us uh in terms of doing anything cooperative mm -hmm. you know because we were kind of a pain in the ass <laughs> you're out in your own little <laughs> mm -hmm. own private idaho um but interesting did you find when you did the accessibility stuff and when you kind of you know, went through that, like your whole notion of what plugins, what themes, what designs, like, like, is that something where you had a moment where you were like, oh, if I could have only known this and what we were up against earlier when I started, you would have done everything differently. Absolutely. <clears throat> I had no clue about web accessibility, much beyond like headers um, at that time. And then you know, like the, it's a whole, a whole world. And I, I don't feel like I know all of it now by any means, but I've, I've at least dipped my toe more deeply in it. And I've looked at like how hard it is to fix broken things. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you're just like, you're spending hours trying to figure out like, why did this jackass use <laughs> four of the same IDs in this construction like there can only be one id of that type on a page why did you do this <laughs> now i have to go through with like javascript and try and fix it um which maybe isn't even a way that's a legal fix but it passes the scanner i don't know you know like it but it led to just hours and hours of work around some of these sites to try and make them into something even semi able to pass the test we were running um so absolutely that, absolutely part of, you know, in a perfect world, everybody who starts to write on the internet, getting at least a little bit of, of knowledge about how this stuff works and what they should keep in mind. Even if it's something as simple as like, keep your headers in order, like it's an outline. Those aren't just for decoration. Yeah. You know, that's pretty simple. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I mean, accessibility is something we've tried I mean, again and again, we built it into our conference in 2019, like, but it's so hard unless you work for an accessibility like shop within a university to get folks to engage that conversation in the same way. And I don't know if there's be questions of legality, obviously, questions of, of overhead or like that still seems like a gap between what's happening and what needs to happen. And I, I wonder what's going to be the thing that maybe ties those two together, maybe just good design or like, I don't know where that's going to fit, but it still feels like, you know, two worlds. And I think if I were starting a WordPress multi-site, like it would be kind of like professional suicide not to take that into consideration out the gate mm -hmm. and then like kind of gear your project towards that. You know, it just, you couldn't do it now. It's too much to risk. 
Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, you want to talk something that's going to sink you pretty quickly, like, and like, there's just the moral idea that like, Hey, (laughs) I'd like this to work for all the people if I can. Um, And so what do you do? And there are tricky spots though. Like if, you know, digital histology maybe is a good example you know, what level of description is sufficient for a cell microscope slide image, Mm -hmm. right? You get into ideas around how much work is going to go into it. You get into ideas in the histology thing, if it's meant for doctors and this resource is meant for people who are able to see because it's a physical requirement of the degree, like what impact does that have on the level of alt text like there there's Mm -hmm. some complicating factors hopefully you know i mean that would be one advantage to better and better ai right is that um that some of this descriptive text can be generated in ways that are more sophisticated but doesn't take an individual human necessarily writing it but trying Mm -hmm. to describe that slide for instance in a way that makes it functional for someone who cannot see it i don't know how you would do it Mm. Right. So you'd be like, there are two rows of four items, you know, like the first, I I just don't know. And like, it it would be really interesting to get somebody with, with deeper knowledge and skills to kind of walk through like, what, what would this look like? What would be sufficient? How would we make it? Because, I mean, one aspect of accessibility is kind of reasonable effort, I believe. is mm-hmm. Maybe that's not the actual term, but, like, that's part of it is, like, where is the balance there? I don't know. And if you're doing this to describe something to see, like, that's the other thing I've, I've always struggled with is, like, the intent and the purpose and the audience. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's stuff that puzzles me. Yeah, I am thinking about this is going back to bringing people in, getting them to participate, which is it's it it feels such like such a cynical thing to say, but I heard it a long time ago and it never really left my mind, which is that in some ways accessibility is maybe not maybe not a marketing tool exactly, but the idea of if your site is inaccessible, you are cutting out potential users. If you want more people to use your site and participate and work using the WordPress multi-site, but your site is overall inaccessible, you're literally just lowering the number of people who could be a part of the project and join in the fun. Um, and that doesn't really hold quite the same for uh, someone who's making their own personal page and then just doesn't adhere to best practices. But from a uh, administrative point of view, keeping that in mind as a moral priority and a legal priority and in some ways a practical engagement priority accessibility is really important i i wonder about that practical engagement piece too because like the the way in which it's a very simple and subtle distinction and i love the way you talked about ai as a possible use for describing that and that kind of Mm -hmm. i want to hear like cool uses of that rather than like (laughs) i've spoken to a chat and they did my homework but like the other idea being like so should you have that accessibility, I think the design, let's take, for example, Twitter versus Mastodon as a tool. The way in which Twitter treated alt text was very kind of like hidden and whatever. And the way in which it's done in Mastodon, it's very like, here it is. And this is something you should do. And like, it's like really easy to do. And it's not like, it's not yelling at you to do it. But yet it almost is like, I feel like I'm going to do it because it's part of the post. Right, mm-hmm. And it's such an interesting, subtle design that gets to that practical point you made, Pilot, that I think will change the way accessibility works on the web if it's done right design-wise. Well, and you can, you can force some things in WordPress that might be advantageous. Like you can say like you can't 
save the image without putting alt text when you do the media upload. Okay. That's a thing that you can kind of rig in. You know, you could say if they don't put in alt text, do this. Um, and the, I think there are some AI ones that will throw in some sort of descriptive text. I think it might be done on, you know, a couple different platforms anyway. And there might be a WordPress plugin or two that will do it. It gets down to two, though, like if it's a decorative image, you shouldn't have alt text in it because it's just going to waste the person's time. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it takes an element of choice and discretion out of it. And. Yeah. You know, it's it's tricky. Right. And one of the things I've always tried to describe to our people when they're kind of like getting tense about different aspects of this is like I can say like the themes accessible. I can say WordPress, the content it creates in this the aspect interface. is accessible. Right. Yeah. The interface is accessible in these ways. But I can't tell you what the individual is going to choose to do. is going to be accessible because they have choice. Yeah. And in any content management system, they're going to have some degree of choice to do things. The only way you can prevent them cr from creating any inaccessible stuff would be to restrict that choice down to virtually nothing. Mm -hmm. And like, then you're just taking away agency. So like to have power, you have to have choice and that comes with risk. And maybe that's my motto with all of this stuff. What's the right balance of those things for this particular goal project people? I can't think of a better place and a better kind of like series of superhero taglines <laughs> to wrap. I was, yeah, I was going to say, what a, note. what a note to end on. Are we missing anything? Because I know we kind of. How can we have missed anything? <laughs> it's impossible. I know, but. Um. Can't think of anything. Anything Tom really wanted to cover that me and mm -hmm. Pilot might have Stay driven old. him down a dirt road somewhere in the deserts of Arizona to talk about something else, like the floridity of the water. Well, what we can try and do is like if we have a place for people to submit their example terms of services, that's a cool thing. If people want to comment on one another's and hypothesis, mm -hmm. I thought that might be a fun way to have kind of a community discussion based on the things that are submitted. Um, and then I don't know if reclaim like wants a thing where you go like, all right, here's DMCA stuff <clears throat> you might think about. Here's accessibility stuff you might think about. Here's um, terms of use stuff you might think about. You know what I mean? So that you could almost clump them I love the idea of there being examples for, like you laid out, terms of use from different schools. How do they do it? Here's what some DMCA yeah. templates. Exactly. Like, I think that would be a great link of resources for folks to see how other people are doing it and a little context for it. And then rather than us giving people a boilerplate, like they right. can choose and that agency is back and hence they'll feel the power and then... <laughs> The whole idea of digital identity and agency fighting against the robots that are taking our jobs will seem real, even though it's not. All right. Shall we all say goodbye? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was going to say it's been really fun and great, but yes also works. Yes. All Bye. right. Bye, everybody.